Where is the most expensive parking space in the world? The answer is New York City, but I suppose I should explain what I mean when I say parking space. I'm talking about a space in either a publicly accessible parking garage or lot, or on the street. I'm not talking about how much some people pay to park a car in the parking garage of their condo or something like that. The company Parkopedia publishes their research on parking space prices annually, and they found that the average cost for a two-hour parking space off-street, like in a lot or garage, is $43.10. Other U.S. cities like Chicago, Boston, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., and San Francisco are in the top 10 globally. London, England also makes the list with an average cost of just over $16. U.S. The other three places on the top 10 are all from one country. Can you guess? It's actually Australia. The second most expensive off-street parking in the world is in Sydney, followed by Brisbane and Melbourne. In fact, if you were to average all of the two-hour off-street parking costs by nation, Australia would be at the top of the list, with the average cost of nearly 20 US dollars. The US in second place is less than half of that. What about on-street parking? Where is the most expensive parking meter city in the world? The answer here is quite different. Europe is the world leader in on-street parking costs. Amsterdam leads everyone with a two-hour average cost of over $13. London, Paris, Oslo, Moscow, Oxford, and Drammen are all other European cities found in the top 10. New York, Chicago, and Seoul also crack the list. 70% of the top 50 cities are located in Europe. Amsterdam is one of only a few cities where the on-street parking rates are higher than the off-street parking rates. It's usually the other way around. You can expect to pay, on average, 300% more parking in an off-street garage than on the street in New York, and nearly that in Melbourne or Sydney. These results are interesting, but what's even more interesting is the story behind the numbers. Why do Amsterdam and Paris have more expensive on-street parking? Why is parking so expensive generally, and is there an optimal price to charge for parking? It turns out, yes, there is. Let's find out what it is after the bike bell. Parking in New York, as we established, is expensive. Here's the website Best Parking, which shows the price of parking lots and garages, and here in Manhattan you can see some pretty eye-popping prices. Remember that $43 was the average, so there are some garages that are quite a bit higher. And the prices that you see here on Best Parking is the hourly rate, and that $43 number is for two hours. So why so high? This is going to be a theme, but it all comes down to economics, to supply and demand. Private parking garages can charge what they want, and they'll charge as much as they can while still filling the garage. Why is there more demand for parking and less supply for parking in New York City compared to every other city in the world? Well, as it turns out, New York City is in the United States, a country filled with cars. Even in the densest part of the biggest city in the US, 22% of households own a car. The number is even higher in the outer boroughs. 83% of all households on Staten Island own a car, and lots of people commute from the outer boroughs and beyond into Manhattan. And despite the best rail access the US has to offer, Lots still use their own cars. Lately, traffic has gotten even worse. According to one measure, car ownership spiked over 200% in 2021 due to people giving up on mass transit during the pandemic. Parklets for outdoor dining and new bus lanes have eliminated parking spaces at the same time. Available on-street parking spaces in the city are rarer than ever, and residents have to pay anywhere from $400 to $700 a month for a dedicated spot in a garage. So there are a lot of cars, but the dense central city doesn't have a lot of parking spaces to accommodate all those cars, so parking is high. This dynamic plays out in other US cities, just to a lesser extent. Seemingly, everyone in the Chicago area has a car, for example, and expects that they can drive it right to Michigan Avenue. They just have to pay for the privilege. What about Australia? Is it the same phenomenon? Pretty much. 91% of households in the country have access to cars, but the central business districts of places like Sydney are quite dense, without much space for parking cars prices reflect that. That's off-street parking, but what about on-street parking? Why is on-street parking so much cheaper when compared to lots and garages? You think that on-street parking might be more expensive as there are comparatively fewer spaces available. There are lots of uses for that curb space. Loading zones, bike lanes, bioswales, bus lanes, and other uses all compete for that space. Why doesn't supply and demand work here like it does in off-street situations? The simple answer is, while a substantial portion of off-street parking is owned by private entities, just about all on-street parking is managed by local governments. Now I say just about because cities can't cede management of their parking meters to an outside private entity. Chicago leased its 36,000 meters to a company for 75 years. That company paid a billion dollars for the privilege and 15 years later has already recouped their investment. They did this by raising parking prices closer to market rate. Now Chicago is the only other city besides New York in the global top 10 list of on-street parking costs. 
Basically, if parking is managed by a local government, they don't price the parking according to the supply and demand equilibrium. Street parking is different because it's a public space, and the public can decide to have lower parking prices. Local businesses in particular argue for cheaper parking to attract patrons. They're competing against the Targets and McDonald's in the suburbs, where ample free parking is basically a given. Cities like Amsterdam have higher on-street parking than off-street parking because residents have decided that it is important not to subsidize car use with below market rate prices. Paris is in the process of removing 72% of its on-street parking to better accommodate cyclists, and is pricing the scarce remaining spaces higher than almost anywhere else in the world. Now we know why parking is so expensive, and why places like Amsterdam and Paris have higher on-street parking costs. But is there an ideal price to charge for parking? Well, that just depends what your goals are. There are actually a lot of urban problems related to parking, like traffic and economic development, and different parking prices can solve different problems. For example, a large amount of traffic in central cities comes from people circling the block and circling the block looking for an empty parking space. Planners call this cruising. A 2007 study of New York City streets found that 45% of traffic was drivers looking for a place to park. A 2005 study of Los Angeles found that number was 68%. It's lower but still significant elsewhere too. A 2011 study of Barcelona streets found the number to be 18%. That's not nothing. Let's say that your parking pricing goal is to reduce overall traffic. How do you set the correct price? The tricky thing about setting a parking price that ensures that there's always one free space is that demand changes throughout the day. If you set the price too high in the early morning, nobody will park there, and that's just a waste of parking spaces. Ideally, parking prices would change as demand changes to optimize parking usage. That's what San Francisco tried in their pilot SF Park program. They installed sensors at every meter to determine if a car was parked there or not, and they adjusted parking prices over weeks and months to ensure 60 to 80% occupancy. They created three times with three different pricing points, before noon, noon to 3 p.m., and after 3 p.m. Initially, all parking was set to $3 per hour. After analyzing the data that came in, the prices before noon dropped, they significantly increased during the peak period, and they dropped just slightly after 3 p.m. They achieved their occupancy goals and cruising was cut in half. A study of SF Park noted that variable parking pricing like this are a poor man's congestion pricing, and can be a way a city can slowly get to full congestion pricing. Congestion pricing is when a city charges a toll to enter the central city with the goal of reducing the number of cars there and improving traffic congestion. It turns out that making it expensive to park can have some of the same effects. Like I mentioned before, business owners are often advocating for lower parking prices or simply free parking to attract patrons. But as Shoot puts right on the title, there's a high cost of free parking, and it may not be the best economic development strategy. The cost most relevant to business owners is turnover. Parking meters discourage people from lingering too long. Areas with free parking see cars stick around longer. Sometimes they're taken up by employees, leaving precious few open spaces for customers. I did my own parking study a year ago, and it backs this up. Free parking doesn't make sense in cities where space is at a premium. Paid parking helps more people park and wait less. Paid parking can reduce traffic and even act as a congestion charge. Ideally, every city would implement a smart program like SF Park, where the city has an idea of the occupancy status of every single parking space and can set the price to meet specific goals for each area of the city. Or maybe ideally every city is like Paris that simply reduces the number of on-street parking spaces and gives that space over to buses and bikes. Either way, we may not be far off from that future. I hope you liked the graphics in this video. I was particularly proud of the street with animated cars zooming by, I made those illustrations and animations myself with skills I learned from classes on Skillshare.com. The great thing about Skillshare is they have so many great classes taught by experienced instructors. You just know that you're gonna have a great experience and it really beats hunting down random tutorials elsewhere. If you're a total newbie to Adobe Illustrator and you'd like to learn how to do some of the graphics I do, I'd recommend checking out the Adobe Illustrator Essentials Training by Daniel Scott. He takes you through every tool you could ever need and really cuts down on the Illustrator learning curve. After you take that course, you can take Nicholas Felton's course on designing illustrator maps and infographics. This guy makes some of the most beautiful data-driven maps I've ever seen, and he teaches you all the tips and tricks. It's incredibly high quality content, and you'll be designing maps and infographics sooner than you think. You can learn so much on Skillshare, there's guaranteed to be a course for you. Maybe you want to up your iPhone photography game to improve your social media presence. There are classes for that. Maybe you want to pick up sewing. There's a great class for that. The possibilities are endless. With all of that amazing content, it might be difficult to know where to start, but Skillshare's got you covered. They've designed learning paths to help you get from novice to pro in no time. Learning paths are hand-picked classes meant to be taken in order, 
that build on one another, reinforcing lessons. They're available in a range of experience levels from beginner to advanced and a variety of categories, including design, productivity, creative freelancing, tools, and software like Procreate, Blender, marketing, and more. Skillshare will help you level up on your creativity and productivity. The skills you learn are incredibly valuable, making Skillshare easily worth the price of admission. And there's a special deal going on right now. The first 500 people to use my link will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare. Go give it a try.